Andrew Morrow read classics at Oxford and received his PhD from the Courtauld Institute in 1983. He has taught at MIT, the University of Chicago, and the University of Oregon. His research centers on 16th and 17th century Italian architecture with a particular interest in architectural drawings. His dissertation was on the planning history of the Cappella dei Principi in Florence, and in 1985 he curated an exhibition and wrote the catalog Disegni di Architetti Fiorentini, 1540-1640, for the Gabinetto Disegni at the Uffizi. He has published on Michelangelo's designs for the Medici tombs, winning the Porter Prize in 1992 for that, along with an extensive study of work on the Palazzo dei Conservatori, as well as articles on architecture of Palladio, Vasari, Guarini, and Dossio's work for Niccolo Gaudi. A long article on the Cappella dei Principi will appear later this year. Andrew is currently uh, writing a book titled Vasari's Successor, Niccolo Gatti, Collector of Drawings, and has done extensive research on the, um, on the religious uh, work of uh, architecture of Guarino Guarini. He has full year fellowships, held full year fellowships at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, Cambridge, Villa Itati, the Institute of Fine Arts in New York, Princeton, the Newbury Library, and CASBA. And he is retired now from teaching at the University of Oregon as of uh, 2003, now living in Philadelphia. Today, Andrew will speak to us on the subject dearest to him at this time, Niccolo Gatti and Giorgio Vasari. Please welcome Andrew Morrow. Well, I must thank all, I mean, all of you for coming, to listen to me, after all, um, but also in particular, John Marchari and Inge Ries for inviting me to participate. It's, it's a very flattering invitation to participate in this symposium, and I'm delighted to be here. It is fitting that Giorgio Vasari, the first art historian, should have put together the first collection of drawings formed on historical principles. This was his Libro dei Disegni, or Book of Drawings. Soon after Vasari died in 1574, the Libro passed into the hands of Niccolò Gaddi. I have come to think that Gaddi was a far more important collector of figure drawings than anyone has imagined, and will therefore devote most of my talk to him. <coughs> what opened my eyes <coughs> was studying the frames that have long been considered a unique feature of the Libro. In my view, very few of them were in fact drawn for the Libro, and very many come from the collection of Gaddi. Those drawn for Gaddi reveal a personality that is utterly unlike any other in the history of collecting. So my main emphasis will be on the frames. As a preliminary, I will argue for a radical reappraisal of the Libro, Given the time at my disposal, I can say nothing about Vasari's collecting and very little about Gaddi's. I am showing you here two frames as simply as background for my talk. I associate the left one with the Libro and that of the right, of which you see just a detail, with the Gaddi collection. The images are shown at the same scale. Below them, you will see my attribution to the fra attributions to the framers, as I call the artists who drew the frames, the names I've given Gaddi's framers are self-explanatory. The pages of the Libro were very close in size to Gaddi's mounts, whose standard dimensions were roughly 61 by 40 centimeters, 46 centimeters, I'm sorry, or two foot by 18 inches. Each Gaddi mount consists of just a single sheet, which is often double-sided, allowing for a drawing or drawings to be pasted onto the verso. Most of the mounts have been laid down. Whereas none of the pages of the Libro survive intact, many of the Gaddi mounts do or have suffered only minor losses. In the image at the right, the gold band that frames the drawing proper was added in the 17th century by the collector Everard Jabac, and it appears in all the sheets at the Louvre that you'll see today. Niccolò Gaddi, who lived from 1537 to 1591, had great wealth and considerable taste. Close to the Medici Grand Dukes, he was perhaps especially close to Grand Duke Francesco, 
whom he advised on the purchase of ancient statues, cameos, and the like. Niccolò commissioned the Gaddi Chapel in Santa Maria Novella, the first chapel in Florence, to make extensive use of costly colored marbles, of which Gaddi was a connoisseur. The chapel served, amongst other things, as a display of his wealth and taste. He amassed a collection of encyclopedic scope, running from ancient sculptures to printed books and furniture inlaid with marble. In his will, Gaddi stipulated that the entire collection be kept in its original state and be shown to any gentleman who asked to see it. it I'm sorry for the word. Um, it was, in a sense, a museum. At his death, the collection included, amongst them, an immense number of drawings, a sub-collection of so-called figure drawings. These were housed in 11 portfolios and were, I believe, adorned with the architectural and decorative frames that scholars take to be typical of Vasari's Libro. Ignoring Gaddi's other holdings, I shall refer to the drawings in the portfolios simply as the Gaddi collection. In the 1570s and 80s, as documents show, he had agents send him drawings from Venice, Bologna, and Rome. Although the frames must have given him great personal satisfaction, they were also, I'm sorry, I should mention that he was, after Vasari's death, um, Gaddi was quite possibly the most important collector of drawings in Italy. Although the frames must have given him great personal satisfaction, they were also a form of display and enrichment of the drawings that would have impressed those who visited his collection. Well, as an architectural historian, I am particularly interested in the architectural side of the frames drawn for Gaddi. He had considerable knowledge of architecture and maintained a special rapport with Giovanni Antonio Dozio, whose best known work for him is the chapel on the screen. At the right, you see a drawing for it that Dozio would have presented to Gaddi. It is large, taken to a high degree of finish, and superbly executed. As regards technique, Gaddi made a special effort in many of his drawings for this patron. Gaddi also showed a very early appreciation of architectural drawings as a field worthy of a gentleman collector. Indeed, the superb collection of high Renaissance architectural drawings at Uffizi goes back largely to him. Such was the connoisseur for whom the Gaddi frames were created. These frames, too, will serve as background and are again shown at the same scale. The one on the left, which I associate with the Libro, originally decorated a drawing for an altarpiece that is now kept separately. On the right is a frame drawn for Gaddi. In the first edition of his Lives, published in 1550, Vasari devoted little space to drawings. In 1568, he published the second edition, a greatly enlarged and more serious work that reveals a new interest in art theory. The, a key notion is that of disegno, which means both design in the abstract and drawing in the concrete sense. Vasari intended both meanings when he'd called disegno, I quote, the parent of our three arts, architecture, sculpture, and painting. Otto Kurz plausibly sensed a connection between Vasari's interest in disegno and his Libro dei Disegni. In 1568, the lives thus display a new concern with drawings. Artists are, artists are now judged, not just on their professional specialty, but also as draftsmen. The Libro, Vasari says, contains autographed drawings of all the artists who had made drawings from Cimabue till his own day. He refers frequently to it in the lives as though its contents would interest the visitor. Unlike Gaddi, however, he seems to have made no provision for visitors to see his collection. A family document states that on Vasari's death, Grand Duke Francesco asked his heirs for the Libro and another item as a gift. On receiving them, he promised the family his protection. The book is described as large, and the drawings in it are said to be infinitissimi. I imagine they were poorly organized because that is the natural consequence 
of adding drawings as they are acquired piecemeal to an album. You should note that both in the family document and throughout the lives, it is always libro in the singular, never libri in the plural. For the next mention of the libro, one must wait till 1702, in other words, well over 100 years later. In that year, a posthumous volume of Filippo Baldinucci's Notizia, <coughs> sorry, Notizia was published, containing a passage of enormous importance. It comes in the life of the painter Domenico Passignano and refers to the sale of the Gaddi collection to the Earl of Arundel in 1636. Passignano, I quote, estimated the value of the stupendous paintings and of the five great books of drawings that the heirs of Cavalier Gaddi, their favorite of Grand Duke Francesco, sold to merchants for many thousands of scudi, a sale whose memory will always rankle with Florentine lovers of the fine arts. We should add, to satisfy the curiosity of the reader, that the five books of drawings were those that composed the greatly renowned Libro of Giorgio Vasari, which he so frequently mentioned in his writings, and which contained the drawings of almost all the artists, starting with the first, first restorer of painting, Cimabue. The vagueness with which the passage is written, and a number of errors, indicate that Baldinucci based his account on hearsay rather than on original documents. Stated or implied in his words are three propositions. The first is that the Libro passed from Vasari to Gaddi. Since there is some independent evidence to support this view and nothing against it, I accept Baldinucci's word on the matter. It is the only point on which his text has not been undermined by subsequently published documents. I strongly suspect that Grand Duke Francesco who does not appear to have collected drawings, requested the Libro on behalf of his courtier, Niccolò Gaddi. The second proposition is that the Libro was a multi-volume work. Scholars have accepted this view, impressed, no doubt, by Mariette's statement that he owned one of the volumes. Even so, the evidence for it is weak. The course of events as I see it was as follows. Vasari's Libro was a single album. Gaddi dismembered it, dispersing its contents among the other drawings of his collection. At the time of his death, the collection was kept in 11 portfolios. At some point, one of his descendants had the contents of the portfolios bound into albums. When the albums were acquired by Lord Arundel, there were again 11 of them. Baldinucci, who knew nothing about the earlier stages of the Libro's history, assumed that under Vasari, the Libro was likewise a multi-volume work. The third proposition is that in 1636, the Gaddi collection comprised the Libro and nothing else. That must be why Gaddi's own collecting is ignored in the literature, even though it is well attested by documents. Interested only in Vasari, Scholars have attributed to him or to his helpers the frames that were really drawn for Gaddi. This point is important if one wishes to reconstruct the contents of the Libro. Once we associate a given frame with Gaddi rather than Vasari, the frame tells us only that the drawing inside it had belonged to Gaddi. The problem is then to show that the drawing in question had previously belonged to Vasari. In only two cases do I see good reason to suppose that it did. A few drawings with Gaddi frames actually post-date Vasari's death. We know far less about the Libro's contents than we liked to think. The first reference to any of the frames comes astonishingly late, in the years 1716 to 20. At a time, that is, when the obvious source for the fate of the Libro was Baldinucci. On the verso of a framed drawing, Jonathan Richardson the Younger attributed the frame on the recto, not surprisingly, to Vasari. Yet the frame which you see here is a typical work of Gaddi's chief framer. In 1730, Mariette was the first to assert in print 
that the frames were drawn by or for Vasari. Such is his authority that this view has remained essentially unchallenged. Since I don't trust the written evidence, I turn to that of style. In her standard work on the Libro, Licia Raganti Collobi identified three frames as the work of Vasari. Florian Herb attributes two fra further frames to him and two to Jacopo Zucchi, who often worked for Vasari between 1557 and 1572. A few additional frames look much like the work of Vasari or his immediate circle, making around 10 frames that I would trace back to the Libro. They differ greatly in composition, though in most cases the human figure provides the main interest. In handling, all but one of the frames show a painterly freedom. The volutes on either side of the frame in Stockholm differ in their size and detailing. Oh dear, I'm sorry. Um, that's a pointer. Yes. Now, um, I can't see this very well, but I think you can probably see it better. These volutes are different in size, and the little sort of recessed area at the bottom is quite different in design on the two sides. Also, the internal modeling of the figures is conveyed in part through a mere flicks of the pen. The figures on one side are deliberately varied from those on the other. As Carmen Bambach has suggested to me, Vasari's figurative frames were probably inspired by the allegorical figures that framed the history paintings in his frescoes. In 1950, A.E. Popham and Philip Pouncey published the brilliant discovery on which my work rests. Two sheets have banderoles that give Gaddi's French motto, Tant que je vivrai, as long as I live. While beneath the banderoles are eagle-like birds that must represent his impresa, a falcon. Well, there's a, a sorry, a, a, a falcon as large as you could ever hope to see it on the right. Later, James Byam Shaw drew attention to a third frame of this type. I myself have discovered falcons in five additional frames. Some are small or very small in scale, while others appear simply as heads. In no case are they accompanied by banderoles. The falcons are shown either with their eyes open or with their eyes covered by a hood or cowl that is manipulated by means of a tuft-like grip above the head. The details here, by the way, are not to scale. Three further frames are intimately related to those with the falcons, so that we have 11 Gaddy frames so far. Thanks to a second secure criterion, one can enlarge this group to 23 frames. That is a handsome base for connecting yet further frames with the Gaddy collection. On stylistic and other grounds, I attribute almost 160 frames or fragments of frames to the artists who worked for Gaddy. The chief framer, who is rightly his favorite, drew the great majority of them, including all those with the falcons. A dozen or so frames were the work of Gaddy's second framer. Six other hands were involved, each responsible for just a frame or two. You see, her, you see here a drawing that had belonged to Vasari, but which is set into a majestic frame drawn for Gaddi. Frames such as this required much more labor and, much, and thus much greater expense than those in the Libro. Most of the frames drawn for Gaddi are architectural or quasi-architectural in nature and are thus appropriately given the same treatment as architectural drawings that were intended for presentation to a patron. The freedom of the Libro frames is rejected in favor of careful planning, strict bilateral symmetry, and precise painstaking finish. In the female terms, one of which you see at the far right, Vasari's vivacious handling has no place. As with Dozio, 
the chief framer's fine, sometimes excellent technique surely responds to his patron's wishes. Unlike Vasari, Gaddi's framers are sparing with the human figure. The chief framer admitted human faces and torsos when they formed part of an angel, a siren, there's one, two at the bottom there, or a term. Otherwise, he avoided torsos and kept human faces small. Maybe Gaddi thought he could put up a better show if his draftsmen avoided tackling such, such tests of skill as drawing the nude. At the head of each biography in the second edition of The Lives, Vasari placed a woodcut portrait of the artist concerned set into an edicule. An inscription at the bottom of the edicule gives the artist's name and thus serves as a chapter heading. In the volume owned by Mariette, the drawings were, sorry, the drawings were grouped by artist and each group was headed by the relevant portrait from the lives. One might guess that this system held throughout the Gaddy collection. In fact, seven of Vasari's woodcuts survive in frames that were certainly drawn for Gaddy. The two remaining frames were very likely drawn for him as well because they are done with the care typical of Gaddy's framers and they do not contain the human figure. One of the two at the lower right is a famous frame in a Gothic style for a drawing supposedly by Cimabue. As it happens, the woodcuts do not come directly from the lives, but from a second work that Vasari published in 1568, a compendium of the woodcuts that has no supporting text. Perhaps the Libro did indeed contain woodcut portraits on pages that have been lost. But that seems very unlikely because fitting them in would have meant dismembering the album at a time when the collection was already far advanced. It was surely Gaddy's own idea to integrate the woodcuts with his mounts. In the absence of a woodcut, the frame nearly always contains an inscription whose wording is based on those in the woodcuts. Occasionally, a drawing has no frame, just an inscription. Like the woodcuts, the inscriptions were presumably Gaddy's own idea. All but two of them were written by the chief framer or by someone I call the calligrapher, whom Gaddy rightly preferred for this type of work. I come now to the frames architectural style. A few of them show some influence from the edicules in Vasari's woodcuts, but a far greater number take up ideas from Gaddy's architect, Dozio. At some point, Dozio built, or at any rate designed, a villa for Gaddy outside Florence, Villa Fontalerta. This drawing is for a fireplace in the villa. Dozio has set Michelangelesque tapering piers into the sides of the structure. With horizontal extensions of the architrave above and below, or lugs, on the model of a fairly common treatment for columns. Gaddy liked the invention so much that it appears in at least two doors and a fireplace in the villa. In the present frame, the tapering piers are enriched with the chief framer's own invention, a large block set just below the capital. The individual elements in the frames frequently refer to those of serious architecture, but are far too licentious to, to be imaginable in stone. Furthermore, as a rule, the frames make sense only in two dimensions. In the astonishing frame on the screen, a window surround has metamorphosed into a two-headed monster. At the top are the two halves of a broken curved pediment. At the sides, the heads appropriately serve as capitals. The word capital, by the way, literally means little headpiece. And at the bottom, 
the lugs emphasize the corners. In its every detail, this frame is an, is an outstanding work of the imagination. Before continuing, I should mention that the frame at the left, which was drawn by Zuki for the Libro, has a piece inserted by Mariette at the bottom. Crystal pointed that out yesterday. And that in the Gadi Mount at the right, the small drawings at the upper corners were not part of the original design. The frames are shown at the same scale. The difference between them is great. While Zuki is playing easily with the drawings, this, that, that created for Gadi insists on its own individuality. Yet they have an important point in common. In both cases, the sheet is a composite work of art in which the frame and the drawings are interfused. And that is the rule for both sets of mounts, even when the frame and the drawing are much easier to separate in the mind's eye than they are here. The sheet as a whole should be seen as a composite work of art. If Gaddi's frames tend to be obtrusive, that is because of the interest he took in their design. Evidently, he evidently required that each frame should differ in at least one significant respect from any other. Better still, if it displayed wit, piquant detail, architectural subtlety, or ingenuity in composition. The designing of the Gaddy frames thus assumed a dynamic of its own, so that their appropriateness to the drawings they decorate seems to me largely a matter of chance. Yet, when seen in conjunction with a drawing, a strongly characterized frame does give the mind more to play with than would the drawing seen by itself. Provided such a frame is well designed on its own terms, it can add to the viewer's enjoyment, as I am sure it did to Gaddy's. The Zuki frame, too, enriches the viewer's experience, albeit in a less challenging manner than the one drawn for Gaddy. I consider that Gaddy most likely conceived his project after he had acquired the Libro, and his work on it continued to the mid-1580s, if not later. His intention, in my view, was both to expand the collection formed by Vasari and to present the expanded collection in a manner that made it suitable for showing to visitors. As Crystal pointed out yesterday with regard to Mariette, a system based on portfolios rather than on albums allowed Gaddy to place the drawings just where he wanted them. Since his standard mounts were almost, if not exactly, the same size as the pages of the Libro, he could mingle the two groups in his portfolios without obvious awkwardness. Gaddy's frames, being more elaborate in design and more finished in, more finished in appearance than those in the Libro, provided a more prestigious setting for the drawings. The attributions, whether printed in Vasari's woodcuts or inscribed on the sheet, were obviously helpful to the viewer. More prominent than the inscriptions, the woodcuts would have aided the viewer in finding his way among the mounts. They also emphasized the collection's intimate and prestigious connection with Vasari. Purposely or not, the woodcuts will have given the impression that the Gaddy collection and the Libro were, were identical. One can understand why Baldinucci knew Gaddi only as the owner of the Libro and not as a significant collector in his own right. Vasari had considered the best way of displaying a drawing was to have an artist create a frame around it. Carried out on a grand scale, this approach was bound to prove laborious and expensive. Gaddi took it up partly because his project was conceived in Vasari's shadow partly to impress visitors with his wealth and taste, and in part because it allowed him, in conjunction with his framers, to develop a highly personal form of art. Thank you very much.